All right, in the last video, we spent a fair amount of time talking about how to come up with an LSR line. You're given a whole bunch of data, and in this example, we're talking about temperature and hot chocolate sales. So we have these 12 days where we recorded temperature and hot chocolate sales. We talked about explanatory and response variables. We talked about making a scatter plot. We talked about describing the correlation in terms of the correlation coefficient. But really, the main thing that we've come up with so far is this line, and the equation of the line is given right here, that best fits this data. So if you had to kind of represent all of the dots with the line, you could do so with this line, whose equation our calculator gave us under linreg ax plus b. Let's see if I can come up with that again. There it is. Uh, what I want to do in this video is, all right, you spent so much time coming up with that line. Why? Like, what are you actually going to do with it? Well, one thing we can do with it is you can learn a lot about the relationship using these interpretations of the coefficients from the previous video. And that's really useful. Uh, but what we want to do in this video is two other things with this. So I don't know, maybe two more applications of the LSR line. And those two things are to make predictions and calculate residuals. Okay, so first, making predictions. Um, sure. Maybe you are asked to predict what are these hot chocolate sales on a, I don't know, 50 degree day. Sure, why not? All right, so using all of the data that you have, uh, predict how many hot chocolate sales you'd have on a 50 degree a day. Suppose that tomorrow I know that it's gonna be 50 degrees out and my kid's going out to sell hot chocolate. I'm like, hmm, I wonder how many cups she should bring, he should bring with him to make sure that he's got enough cups for everybody. Well, I don't know if I could make a prediction of how much I expect him to sell, that might help me make my decision on how many cups to bring. At any rate, using all these data points, I wanna predict hot chocolate sales on a 50 degree day. Comment here, we had a 50 degree day in our data. Let's see if we can find it. There it is right here. There actually was a 50 degree day in this data set in which we sold 100 cups of hot cho chocolate. So we probably even find it here. I think that that's this observation right here. All right, that's when we sold 50 cups, or sorry, we sold 100 cups on this 50 degree day. So you're, if you, somebody asks you to predict sales on a 50 degree day, you might be like, well, it's 100, that already happened once. The problem with that is if we use that as our prediction, we're only using one data point to make that prediction. What we really wanted to do is use all of these data points to make that prediction. I mean, maybe there were other things going on on that specific day, other factors that caused this to be higher or lower than expected. I wanna make my prediction not just based on this one day, but on all of my observations. And the way you do that is instead of just looking at the dot, look at the line, right? Because the line was created to best fit all of the data points. So in a sense, the line takes into account all of these green dots here. So all I have to do to make my prediction is ask myself the question, what is the height of the line when the X value, the temperature is 50? So we can kind of ballpark that. It's hard to do, but it kind of looks like the height of the line here when the line has an X value of 50 is, I don't know, somewhere in the 90 range, give or take, somewhere over here. Maybe we can calculate it a little bit more precisely. We wanna know what's the height of the line when the X value equals 50? Well, we have this equation that tells us the height, the Y value of the line for any X value. So if you wanna know the height of the line when X equals 50, all you gotta do is copy this equation, change the X into a 50. So I could say Y equals negative 1.533. And then instead of writing X, write 50, the value of X that I wanna predict. And then plus 167. 0.54 and that's easy I can just plug that into my calculator so if I hit quit to make this back to a regular calculator negative 1.533 times 50 plus 167.54 I hit enter and it spits out this number 90.89 what that's saying is the height of the line that is given by this equation, when the x value is 50, is equal to 90.89. In other words, when I was trying to ballpark the height here, if I kept going over, my graph is pretty good, right? It's just slightly bigger than 90. The height of this line, when x equals 50, is 90.89. So if I asked you this question, this answer would be perfect. It's worth pointing out there's a different way you can do this. If you don't like typing the equation in, you don't need to be able to do it both ways. So if that made sense to you and you want to space out and not listen for a minute, that's totally fine. If you go back to the graph, 
We've seen this before where you can use the trace function. And so if I hit trace, it defaults to go into my observations. So say my first obs or the observation that I'm currently have highlighted has an X value of 50 and a Y of 100. I press the left, X value of 45, Y of 121, right? It cycles between the observations. If I don't want it to cycle between the observations and instead go down to the line itself, I can just press the up key. And now what's going on is it's jumping down. You see how it shows the equation of the line right here? It's jumping down to the line. The cursor is on the line. So I can move left and right and it won't go between the observations. It'll stay on the line the whole time. So all I have to do is move this over so that X equals 50 and I'm good. Well, it kind of shows me decimal points that might be a little bit hard. Turns out you can just type in the number 50 and then hit enter and it'll jump to the point on the line where X equals 50. So you can kind of see it there. It's highlighted now. X equals 50 is telling me my Y value equals 90.89. In other words, if my line is highlighted, which you hit trace and then the up key, and then if you type in 50, it'll tell you the height of the line when X equals 50, which is exactly this value here. So either by typing it in algebraically or by finding it geometrically, you can find this Y value, which is the predicted hot chocolate sales on a 50 degree day. And the first of the two applications that we wanna be able to do. The second of the two applications will use the first of them is where you calculate residuals. So maybe I ask you to find the residual of the observation of the 50 degree day, sure. Well, to do this, you have to understand what a residual is. So I guess I should start with that. So the idea with the residual is every observation has a residual. Think about how wrong the line is. Every observation has a residual. It's just how far above or below the line the observation is. So like this observation right here is way below the line. This observation where X equals 15, I had the Y value equal 100. But the line is saying when X equals 15, the Y value should be way bigger, way up here, almost 150, right? The distance from the actual observation to the expected observation is what's called the residual. And when the actual observation is below the line like this, your residual is negative. So however far that is, about 40 or so, would mean that this residual is negative 40. This observation is slightly above the line, right? Maybe 10 or so above the line. So this residual would be roughly positive 10. This residual is above the line, maybe 15 or so. So this residual would be roughly positive 15. This one is ever so slightly below the line, maybe one below the line. So the residual here would be negative one. And these are all ballpark values, right? You'd have to calculate them specifically. Um, but just looking at these, I'm saying about what they are. Well, if every observation has a residual, I can ask you to calculate the, the residual if I specify the observation I'm talking about. The 50 degree day, that's that same observation that I've already talked about, the one that's circled right here. I'm asking you, what is the residual of this observation? All I'm asking you is how far above the line is this dot? Right, if I go straight down here, the distance from here to here, what is that? I mean, I don't know. I kind of looking at it, it looks like it's about 10 or so, but I don't know exactly. But I could calculate it. The residual is always just the actual Y value minus the expected Y value. And you can memorize that if you want, but it kind of makes sense with this interpretation of how far above the line a point is. The actual Y is what, 100? But the expected Y was what, like 90 or so? So it's about 10 above. That's all the residual is. Maybe we want to do it a little bit more precisely down here. Sure, the actual Y value. Well, let's see, on the 50 degree day, I can go to my data set and I can say the actual Y value was 100 on that day. So the actual Y is just 100. So I'll put that into my formula. I know the scrolling is kind of annoying. The expected Y value, well, I just calculated that. It's right here. All right here's the expected Y value. It's the 90.89. The expected Y value on the 50 degree day is what we did over here a second ago. 90.89, if I subtract these two numbers, I get 9.11, or more or less 10. This is telling me how far above, in this case, because it's positive, the line that observation was. That's the residual. Okay, I kind of understand why I would do this one, right? I kind of understand making predictions, that makes sense. But why would I ever want to calculate a residual? That makes no sense at all. Okay, practically, from a practical point of view, you probably wouldn't calculate a residual, but to understand what we're doing here, the whole process of finding this line, your calculator chose the line to minimize something to do with residuals. 
So now that we understand what residuals are, I can finally explain to you how your calculator came up with this line in the first place. Well, I don't know that you need to know this. I mean, I don't, can't imagine a world in which I could test you on this, but I think it's kind of interesting. What makes this line fit the data the best? Well, what your calculator does is it calculates the residuals for each of these observations, and then it doesn't want negatives and positives canceling each other out, so it squares them all, because a negative times a negative is a positive. So if this one was negative 40, I'm gonna square it, so it becomes a positive number. So it squares all of the residuals, and then it adds those up. And then all it aims to do is minimize the sum of the square of the residuals. When this is talking about my LSR line, the least squared residuals, all I'm saying is I want the sum of the squares, because we're multiplying by himself to make them so that they're not negative, of the residuals to be as small as possible. That's how it comes up with this line in the first place. So typically you're asked to calculate a residual just so you kind of understand what makes a line good. And maybe that sort of makes some sense now. Like try drawing a bad line. Oh, there's a terrible line, right? Well, it's terrible. You can look at it and tell that it's terrible. But like, how could your calculator explain to you that this line was terrible? Well, your calculator would say, I, the calculator, found all the residuals. So here's one residual, that huge number there. Here's another residual, however far that is. And then square them all and add them up. The sum, meaning add up all those squares, is going to be huge, much, much bigger than it was in the case of this blue line. In fact, this blue line was optimal in some sense. It was optimal in the sense that it minimized the sum of the square of the residuals. Those are the two applications that we're looking for in this video. If you can make predictions using your LSR line and calculate residuals using your LSR line, you got everything that I need.